As a finance professional in a disrupted business landscape, what does it take to be in demand? What does it take to attract great paying international roles? If you're an ICANN member, it'll just take one exam. That's all it takes to complete the globally recognized SEMA professional qualification and the internationally in respected CGMA designation. As a SEMA member and a CGMA designation holder, employers will look at you as a finance professional, constantly acquiring new skills to add value to the business. That's why they'll be willing to pay premium to hire and retain you. If you have five years of relevant experience and are an ICANN member, you can directly sit for the final exam of the SEMA professional qualification, the strategic case study exam. Start studying the SEMA professional qualification. Prepare to make an impact. Good evening, professional colleagues, friends of chartered accountants, students, ladies, and gentlemen. I want to welcome you to another episode of ICANN on Air, powered by the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria. This day, Tuesday, 2nd August, 2022. And it is my pleasure to appreciate all our listeners for being part of this educative and knowledge enlightening uh, session every Tuesday and Thursday. And we are here once again to discuss another topical issue that is beneficiary to you and I, government, and every stakeholder. And the topic of our discussion today will be taxation of the digital economy and the two pillar solution you and i know that practically everything is being digitalized now and i have uh, the my guest with me that will be discussing the implications uh for nigeria join me as uh, we put together our guests for today who will be discussing the topic with us mr abiodo kayode ali uh, Mr. Biodun Kayode Ali uh, is here to discuss the taxation of digital economy and the two pillar solution, the implication for Nigeria. And uh, let me quickly introduce Mr. Abiodun. He is a manager with PwC uh, in Nigeria with several working experience in as an auditor before proceeding to the Tax and Regulatory Service Unit. He has vast experience providing tax and consulting services to clients across financial institutions, services, uh, energy, and consumer market uh, of the industry. A seasoned trainer and regular speaker on both local and international news on issues affecting Nigeria and Africa. He used the centers around the monetary policy the debt, the research, distress, recession, inf inflation, to mention a few. He holds both BSc and MSc degree in economics from Bowen University and the University of Lagos, uh, respectively. A member of uh, the Association of Certif uh, Chartered Certified Accountant. That is our guest for today. And uh, you and I know the importance of... Uh, digital economy practically everything that we need to talk about these days is being digitalized and that is one of the benefits of what you and I are hooking up today so we are ready for a very wonderful time today all i just need to do is that get your pen get your book to learn another thing that will equip and increase you on every side i want to encourage you that you stay tuned i will quickly go on a very short break and when i'll be coming in i'll be coming in with a guest to do justice to the topic of today. Stay tuned, I will be right back.
Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. And uh, like I said at the intro, we are talking on taxation of digital economy and the two pillar solution, the implication for Nigeria. And I have with me our guest, uh, Mr. Abiodun Kayode Ali. Mr. Abiodun Kayode Ali, good evening and welcome to the show this evening. Good evening, Sherson. Thank you for having me. My pleasure, always. Yeah, let's hit the ground running. Taxation, taxation and taxation. Uh, that is a very key uh, word. Due to its uh, global relevance in the revenue generation and strategic survival of Nigeria economy, our global viewers and audience connected all over uh, are waiting to hear from you, your reservoir of knowledge. Please, to start with, can you educate us? What is taxation? All right. Thank you very much, so once again. Um, so taxation, or let me just say tax. Tax is actually a compulsory levy. Um, it's a levy that is being imposed on profits, and it's also it could also be imposed on turnover. But basically, it's a compulsory levy that... Um, you have to pay whether you enjoy a direct benefit from it or not. And um, the sad truth about taxes, like you rightly said, is that not everyone likes that word, but there is a common um, proverb or a common phrase that I said, idiom that goes does that says that there are two things that are certain in life and that's death and taxes. And if you want to even draw it to historical periods, right? If you go back, in time if you look at um um the time of joseph right in the religious book the bible we understand that at a point in time when he was an administrator and a prime minister in egypt he um, was able to provide um seeds to people at one point when there was famine in the land but at one point he had a deal with them and he told them that for every seed they plant by the time they harvest a certain portion of it would go to the pharaoh back then so you can see that tax goes far back as we can think of even in this life in in, in history books right so mm. that's what i can say about taxes it's simply a compulsory levy and the one important thing about tax four canons about tax that um we've been told by adam smith um that's the popular scottish philosopher he said um some of the things he said about taxes are that um it, there should be certainty right there should be certainty when it comes to tax and um some other canons i can't remember right now but uh, certainty is one of them but one important thing we should know about taxes is that you might not necessarily get a direct benefit when you pay your taxes so i'll give mm. you a very good example if you pay your taxes right your taxes will be used by government for public goods social goods right the government could use that um money your tax to probably work on roads right and even after paying those taxes it doesn't necessarily mean that because you paid more taxes than maybe your neighbor you would have access to a larger sphere of the road right it doesn't necessarily mean that right That's so you really. just have to pay it and you just have to trust that the government will use it for the right thing that's what i can oh. say about taxes very brilliant submission and to start with taking us to ages our taxation has been right from the onset. And there's one keyword that you use, a, a compulsory levy. And then one of the canon tells us that it is certain. That is, uh, the, the, the two things is debt and tax. If you are going to die, we all know that is sure. So the other thing is, you must definitely pay your tax. And you may not get direct benefit. While we are still moving on, uh, when talking about uh, economics, we have heard about pure market economics, pure command economics, traditional economy, mixed economy, et cetera, et cetera. The new grammar we are hearing now is digital economy. And it appears to be drawing so much attention. Can you educate our viewers? What is digital economy and uh, the ABC of it so that we can have a deeper understanding of digital economy? Right, thank you very much. So, um, okay, so when you talk of the digital economy, you're simply referring to um, 
a current economy, right, whereby technology is the order of the day, right? Technology rules the day in such ways that it simplifies activities. It simplifies the way we live. It simplifies everything we do. And a very good example I'm going to give is if you consider back in time when we were young, um, I don't know how many of us used to um, borrow um, cassettes. How many of us remember what they call cassettes? Um, VCR, video cassette recorder. If you, you wanted to get viral a, to roll like this, very correct. If you wanted to get a movie from the video club, you know you would have to get out of your house. You would have to take a bus to the nearest video club. You would rent a movie, right? And you would come back home and play it on your um, cassette recorder, right? Back in those days. But if you consider now, you don't have to do that. All you simply have to do is you bring out your phone and you simply go on some site or you download some apps and you have access to movies. And you know one funny thing? Those particular companies that are responsible for um, these apps, they probably might not even be in your territory. They might have no office mm. in your territory, right? Same another example would be if you consider going to the um if you consider going to some shops or if you consider going to some eateries, right? In the past, you have to physically walk down there. But right mm. now, all you simply have to do is just bring out your phone, you just make a request, and someone transports that particular item that you want and delivers it at your doorstep. So the digital economy has made life simple and it has also made business seamless in such a way that you don't necessarily have to be physically involved in some of these activities. So it has kind of taken out some of the um, players that you would see or some of the um, activities that you would ordinarily have carried out back in time. So these are some of the things, the advantages that we can see with the digital economy. And for every advantage, for every benefit, there is also a disadvantage that comes with it. And okay. these are some of the things that we will be considering when we are looking at the issue of taxing the digital economy. Brilliant submission, brilliant submission. When you talk about digital economy, which is the new language for this new generation, you talk about things that are driven by technology. And part of the advantage is it simplifies things. I remember if you have to grant this kind of interview, so possibly you'll be driving down to the island or I will be driving. But now at the comfort of our distance, I don't know whether you're talking to me from United Kingdom, but like I know, <laughs> we have so many of our viewers cut across from Canada, from Australia, listening to you. And that's part of a digital uh, economy that we're talking about. As tax expert, uh, Mr. Biodo uh, Ali, how can you describe or assess the depths of understanding and application of taxation of digital economy in Nigeria, in particular, and across the globe in general? Okay, so it's thank you very much for that question. It's, it's very important, very key. One has a very good understanding of um, taxation of the digital economy because one way or the other, it has implications for individuals, it has implication for government, right? It has far-reaching implication and also for businesses, right? Those are the three economic agents in um, when you um, look at it from an economic um, standpoint, right? So a lot of things are happening digitally, right? And if you look at the current times that we're in, let me take government, for instance. The current times that we're in, um, if you consider what happened in 2020 with the impact of the pandemic, a lot of governments were in need of revenue to finance um, health um, facilities, health um, institutions, right? But then you would see a situation whereby we have some companies that are carrying on business right from their own jurisdiction. They don't necessarily have to come into your country and they are carrying out business, but they are not paying taxes. Government is in need of such um, revenue. So definitely from the point of government, it does have a big role to play. Let me take you back to um, the 1920s. The, uh, yeah, let me take you back to 1920. So in 1920, the tax, the current international tax system that we operate on, it was designed during that period. And during that period, there was no expectation, there was no foresight up that things would change drastically, right? The expectation was that for you to tax a multinational company, that is a company that is probably resident somewhere else, 
but he's carrying on business across the globe. For you to tax that path, that type of company, you would need something referred to as a physical presence to create that connection for you to tax it. So what that simply means is that until that multinational entity has a branch or a subsidiary in your jurisdiction, that's the only basis for you to tax it. But things have changed. It doesn't work mm. that way. You see situation whereby a lot of multinational companies, they are probably resident somewhere in Ireland or probably resident somewhere in the United States, but they are making tons, millions of money from mm. economies like Nigeria, right? So from that perspective, it is very important that government has a thorough understanding of the activities of the digital economy. Also, from the point of view of um, individuals, for instance, this is also important because if you consider it, you are actually paying a price. You're actually paying a price for the services you enjoy. Now, therefore, if there's going to be any form of tax that is going to apply, right, on some of these um, digital services, one thing that is going to happen is that it's going to actually, it could translate to higher costs for you. So it's something mm. that you as an individual also need to understand. And I'm sure there are so many individuals here that have private accounts with some of these um, social media companies. I'm not going to name them, mm. but I'm sure we do know mm. them. And mm. I'm sure you probably received a notification sometime earlier this year telling you that the price is going to increase because Nigeria has probably introduced some taxes or maybe the yeah, United States yeah. government has introduced taxes as well. So that's why it's very important that we all have a fair idea of um, taxation of the digital economy. Very brilliant uh, submission, and uh, I allude to that, uh, uh, your submission. But before I go to pick on the two-pillar solution, let me ask this question by uh, asking that you give us practical examples of a digital economy in Nigeria. And what makes them unique? I know you explained the other time they are technical, technological, you know, driven, but what are practical examples that you can give to our listeners uh, to understand deeper, you know, digital economy. And uh, will it be right to say that they complement uh, the traditional economy? Yeah, thank you very much, So, Okay, that's a good question. Okay, so from a practical perspective, um, one thing I'm going to say is if you, if you look at um, businesses right now, right, a lot of businesses, small and medium-scale enterprises, they don't necessarily have to open a shop right i'm sure you can agree with me and can attest to this that a lot of businesses are currently running and all you have to do is you just have either a phone a mobile device or mm -hmm. a laptop right Confirm. and right from your home right from your home you can register as a company right or you can register under a business name and all you need what you simply need to do is to advertise your business on a lot of um social media apps you have the whatsapp you have the facebook you have the instagram lots of them like that you simply advertise your businesses and you get customers and get a lot of people who patronize you this is the digital economy we're simply talking about right you mm. trying to make use of technology you trying to make use of digital platforms to facilitate your business if you remember sometime um sometime last year there was an issue with twitter Right. I'm sure you mm. quite remember how lots of yeah, businesses, yeah. Especially small businesses, complain about the loss of revenue that they mm. were um, they were experiencing all as a result of the government decision to actually ban Twitter in Nigeria. So these are examples of um, what we experience here in Nigeria. Right. And um, if you also remember, you know, Lagos State is a very busy area. Um, prior to the ban, the Okada ban, we had um, Gokada, we had different types of uh, motorcycles. Um, you could simply... From, the, from your phone, you could simply make a request and you could get to anywhere despite the traffic situation. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the digital, this, these are some of the things that we can consider when we're looking at the digital economy. So those are some of the examples I can give off the top of my head. And um, to your second question, which is um, quite correct. Yes, the digital economy does help the traditional economy because like we said, um, if you look at the example I gave in terms of advertisement, in terms of even transport in terms of logistics logistics very important if i look at um some businesses that have to do with probably um retailing probably um sale of food right logistics helps you to like um you see a lot of people having this kind of um what, what would i call it this kind of 
partnership, right? Partnership with yeah. um, distributors, yeah. right? Easily transporting items from one place to another. Then if you also consider the banks, for instance, the banks, right? So you, if you if you consider you wanting to go to a bank, you would have to physically walk in to a bank to carry out a transaction. But right now, you simply, right from your phone, you could make a transfer. I'm sure some of us have not visited um, a physical branch in a very long time, right? So you can see that <laughs> complementary effort. So these are some of the practical examples. And yes, the digital economy does complement the traditional economy. And hopefully very soon, we'll even phase out the um, a lot of these um, traditional activities. Probably not entirely, but to some reasonable extent, it will. Very wonderful submission. And while you are making your submission, you eat at me because I can't remember the last time I visited the bank to do any transaction. But you just sit at the comfort of your home and transactions are going. Uh, same is applicable. While we go to the uh, intake of it, uh, we have heard of the phrase, the two pillar solution for addressing me. What? what? can we say is this two pillar solution what are the roles that they do in relation to taxation of digital economy all right thank you very much Jason, for that question okay so simply the two pillar solutions um i'm going to call pillar one and pillar two um these are solutions that were agreed on by um, a particular group referred to as the inclusive framework so um, to start with, the inclusive framework comprises of the OECD countries, about 34 of them. It comprises of also the G20, right? You're looking at a group of um, 20 advanced economies of the world and other developing countries. So the combination of these three, the OECD, the G20, and other developing countries, they make up what is referred to as the inclusive framework. So basically, the inclusive framework came up with these two um, solutions, right? We refer to them as pillar one and pillar two. Simply what they are designed to do is that they are meant to help, right? They are meant to help um, nations across the world. They are meant to provide a solution, right? The first one provides a solution to taxation of the digital economy, which we've been talking about. We talked about how things have changed right from 1920 till date. If you remember, I started by saying that in 1920, that was when we had the current existing international tax rules, which requires that you must be physically present in a nation before you tax the activities of that multinational enterprise. But given the impact of technology and digitization, We've seen a lot of enterprises make profits without paying their right um, share, their fair share of taxes in those jurisdictions that um, revenues were generated from. So to address this problem, we have um, pillar one. And to address the problem of something referred to as the race to the bottom. The race to the bottom simply means a situation whereby we've seen some um, economies of the world who are probably not um, competitive economically. What they've simply done is to lower their tax rates. And in lowering their tax rates, they are simply bringing in or they are simply sending invites to multinationals to come over and do business in their jurisdiction. And it's mm. kind of giving them a sort of an advantage, right? So to address these issues whereby we see lots of economies trying to do the same thing, right, moving encouraging uh, multinational entities to shift their profits from areas where they will be taxed at a very high rate to their mm. own territories to avoid these issues. That's why we have um, pillar two. So basically, if you consider these two problems that we have, that's why we have this solution coming here to address them. And one important thing, like I said, is that if you remember, the pandemic created a need for most nations to come up with different ideas to raise revenues. So we've seen situations whereby these nations are trying to come up with measures, measures that can be referred to as unilateral measures to try and get revenue from these digital um, multinational entities one way or the other. 
So to avoid a situation whereby there is a conflict between nations of the world, whereby India has its own unilateral measure, Nigeria has its own unilateral measure, the United States has its own unilateral measure, and there is this kind of trade war among countries. So to avoid all these problems that I've mentioned, we have the two-pillar solution. So in a nutshell, that's exactly what the two-pillar solution is meant to address. Trade wars um, coming from unilateral measures, problems from the digital economy, and also the problem that I can term or is commonly referred to as the race to the bottom. These are the problems that the two pillar solutions basically are meant to address. Brilliant submission. And uh, given that deep expository of the genesis of pillar one, pillar two, uh, how the, the bodies that formulated uh, this, that's talking about the OEDC, the G20 and other developing country, at least to uh, close the gap of this unilateral measure so that we can all benefit uh, from it. Let me pick you on the but before I go there, let me tell our viewers, like we all know, this is always an interactive session. Uh, Mr. Abiodun Kayodi Ali is fully prepared to do justice and enlighten us more on this topic of today, which is a taxation of a digital economy uh, and the two-pillar solution the implication in Nigeria. While we proceed, uh, Mr. Biodu Ali, as a Nigerian tax expert, what can you say as specific implication of the two-pillar solution to Nigeria in relation to taxation of digital economy? Specifics. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there is one thing I need to quickly point out. So um, if you look at the inclusive framework, right, out of about 141 members, right, four countries did not sign on to that solution. Um, Nigeria is one of them. We have Nigeria, mm. we have Kenya, we have Sri Lanka, and we have Pakistan. And you know, it's quite interesting. If you look at the names of these countries I've mentioned, if you look at it from um, global events that are taking place, these are countries that are in need of revenue. You know what happened to Sri Lanka, right? Yeah, and you yeah. know Kenya is currently in a debt distress, right? Yes, and is in need yeah. of help. And Nigeria itself, we need we need <laughs> revenue seriously, right? So Nigeria actually did not sign to the two pillar solution. And um, when you talk of the direct implication, right? Um, if I look at um, pillar two, right? Pillar two, pillar two has an impact such that pillar two simply says that there should be something referred to as a fifteen percent effective tax rates, global minimum tax rates of 15%. That's what Pillar 2 says. Now, there are some elements of Pillar 2 that simply say that if by chance any of the subsidiaries of a multinational entity is not paying an effective tax rate of 15% in a jurisdiction. So I'll repeat what I just said again. If by chance the subsidiary of a multinational entity is not paying that 15% minimum effective tax rate in a jurisdiction. The country of the parent company will then levy a tax, a top-up tax, to ensure mm -hmm. that that 15% is actually achieved. So I'll give you a quick example. If I say I can, probably if, if, if we say something like um, I can um, Nigeria, has a subsidiary in ICANN Ghana, right? If ICANN Ghana is not paying a minimum effective tax rate of 15%, it simply means that Nigeria, that is the country of the parent company, the parent company. can tax the revenue such that it comes up, that effective tax rate in Ghana mm -hmm. comes up to comes 15%. Up. Exactly. So by implication, what that simply means is that for most of the multinational entities, right, whose um, whose parent company are in regions that have signed on to the two pillar solution, if it happens that um, the effective tax rate in Nigeria is lower than fifteen percent, by implication, what that means is that the parents, the parent um, company, would have to pay the the um, top up tax, right, top in that up. jurisdiction, right. So that's an implication and. Um, one of the things that um, the FRS have tried, the FRS simply means the Federal and Land Revenue Service. That's our mm -hmm. tax authority here um, for the viewers, right? So one of the things that the FRS has tried to say is that um, this kind of gives um, 
we need to go back to the drawing board, right, and look at the effective tax rate of some of these multinational entities in mm -hmm. such a way that um, it kind of comes up to 15% because the truth is that what is not taxed here will be taxed somewhere else, right? Mm -hmm. So these are, these are some of the implications that we have. And considering that um, Nigeria didn't sign up to it, Nigeria actually has a substitute, right? Nigeria actually has something else that it's trying to use to address the taxation of the digital economy. And that is simply referred to as the significant economic presence rules. The significant economic presence rules was introduced um, in 2020, along with the Finance Act 2019. I, I don't know if I'm going into technical territories. I would love to. No, you are still on course. You're still on course because I'm, our listeners need to have a deeper knowledge of this. So you floored, floored. Okay. Okay. So in, in 2020, um, we had something referred to as the Finance Act. All right. So the Finance Act is simply, um, it's actually an act. It's actually a document that helps to amend um, various taxes, right? Using just that act, just that instrument. Now, um, with the advent of the Finance Act 2019, there was a provision referred to as significant economic presence. What that simply means is that, um, the Nigerian government is looking at a situation whereby we're going to have some multinational entities that are probably um, deriving some revenue or carrying on business one way or the other, right, from the Nigerian economy. So mm -hmm. it simply means that if they're carrying out economic activities up to a significant level, right, Nigeria has that power to tax their income. That's what it mm -hmm. simply means. Um, there are some activities that um, only withholding tax would apply. Um, technical activities, management services, consultancy and professional services, um, just the 10% withholding tax would apply anytime um, foreigners are probably carrying on business with, in Nigeria. There is also another level, another type of the significant economic presence, which I can term the digital significant economic presence. What that simply means is that if you have any multinational entity that is probably generating 25 million naira from Nigeria in a year, if you have a multinational entity that is carrying on business in Nigeria and is generating 25 million naira in a year, and it's doing this through a digital platform, right? That is enough to create what is re what's referred to as a digital significant economic presence. By implication, it simply means that you are more or less going to do what is required of a normal Nigerian company. So you are required to um, file your tax returns to the tax authorities. You're also required to submit financial statements of your parent, your group, you're right? You're, you're expected okay. to submit financial statements of your group company. You're expected to submit it while filing. You're also expected to prepare a report of your activities in Nigeria, which is expected to be certified by a chartered accountant, right? And you're expected to pay mm. taxes, right? So these are some of the these are some of the things that Nigeria has has done. And um, there is this quick information that came out on the first of July, where we have um, the current head of the FRS saying that right from the introduction of the significant economic presence in Nigeria, Nigeria has actually generated about two billion naira till mm. date. Um, mm. I believe there is potential for Nigeria to generate more than that, but I think I'll stop. I'll stop there for now. Stop that, there that, for that, that's a great talk because we were, as we are just making uh, alluding to those uh, uh, point, I wanted to bring something which you have actually uh, attest to. So give us the measure uh, of this uh, contribution to digital economy. You know, when you talk about the overall growth and development, is it high? Is it low? Uh, is it medium? But you just mentioned that uh, the FRS uh, 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 chairman uh, confirmed that if from this significant uh, uh, digital economy, significant presence, we have about two billion uh, rate. But let me still affirm it. Will you say that uh, the rate of contribution of digital economy to the overall growth is it low? Is it medium or is very high? Oh, okay. Um, so the contribution of the digital economy to um to the Nigerian economy in general. So I think when you say the contribution, let me just confirm, are you referring to the contribution in terms of the taxes, the revenue that was generated, or are you looking at it from the bigger picture overall 
to everyone. Is can com I confirm com exactly? Com com combine the two together so that our viewers can definitely enjoy it. Okay, all right, no problem. Um, so when you look at it in terms of the economy, right? To be very honest with you, I can imagine a situation, and I'm going to bring, um, I'm going to try and uh, refresh your memory. I don't know if you remember a particular point in time last year when Facebook had an issue. You know, Facebook is currently um, the owner of WhatsApp, Instagram, and Facebook itself, right? Do you correct. remember a particular correct. point in time when WhatsApp was no longer working, Instagram was no longer working, yeah. Facebook wasn't working? It was like everyone was complaining. People were like, what is going on? Right, so it's like we're going back to the stone age. So if the we are, we are in the in the dark age for that period, exactly for about I think I think a day. A and day, yeah. It was restored the next day. So to be quite honest with you, it's it's practically it's it's practically impossible to do business without the digital economy currently. You can imagine mm. what would happen if um, your network goes down, if the banks are probably not able to um, carry on um, their internet services, right? Or even the mobile telcos, right? So it's very important, very relevant. And I alluded to the fact that even Twitter, right? We saw the impact. And I think there are um, a lot of companies, a lot of um, analysts that kind of told us how much Nigeria was losing right from the um, right from the point that Twitter was banned. So it's actually very important to the GDP. And I think the World Bank even estimated it that the digital economy, sometime in 2020, the World Bank said that the digital economy accounts for about 15.5% of GDP, of the world mm. GDP. So it's actually quite important, very important. Then also very in terms good. of taxation, right? In terms of taxation, it's significantly important. So um, I know 2 billion might actually look low. It might look like a drop in the ocean, but um, the way our taxes run is that um, companies are allowed to do what is referred to as self-assessment, self-assessment, yeah, right? Yeah. So what that simply means is that you as an individual, you are meant to um, declare, you are meant to state what your revenue is and you are meant to, on that basis, um, take out the operating costs and arrive at your profit, your actual profit, and on that basis, you pay your taxes, right? Then after a while, the tax authorities conduct an audit, right? Just to be sure that you've actually paid the right taxes. So at the moment, um, from my experience, I know that um, a lot of the companies, the digital companies that have voluntarily filed their tax returns with the tax authorities, I don't know of much of them that have been audited. But what I expect is that by the time audits begin to take place, um, that two billion might actually um, go higher, right? And I know one other thing that the tax authorities are currently doing right now is that they are putting in place technology, right? They are putting yeah, in place technology yeah. to ensure that um, they are able to capture the activities of a lot of these multinational um, entities, and they are also able to identify how much. Though it's a bit difficult to identify how much they're actually um, earning from Nigerian activities, but they are trying to put in place technology. The expectation is that over time, they'll begin to build experience and probably that $2 billion that was reported will probably become bigger. That's the expectation. That's what Brilliant. I can see. Brilliant. Yeah, Brilliant. And I can tell you for free, the introduction of technology, as we heard from FRS, has contributed immensely to the uh, revenue generation, and uh, we're still counting. Uh, 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 Kinsley is asking this question. Uh, firstly, appreciating you for the insight that you've given. But well, he wants to know, uh, is Nigeria taking advantage uh, of this sig significant digital presence by taxing Facebook, Google, Amazon, and all those uh, digital companies? An insight to this question, please. All right, thank you, Kingsley. Um, that's a good question. Okay, so um, I would say yes. I would say yes um, because it it was even apart from even this um, significant economic presence, right? Um, Nigeria in the Finance Act 2021, which is the most recent Finance Act that is available, Nigeria introduced some certain measures, right? And one of the measures that was introduced was that. Um, Nigeria, the tax authorities can now tax um, the revenue, can tax the revenue of these companies on a fair, if on a fair and reasonable basis. So what it simply means is that if Nigeria then discovers, or if the FRS discovers that um, probably it doesn't agree with the revenue that is being declared, 
by uh, most of these companies, Nigeria can now um, tax the revenue. Now, the there was this report that you must have heard in the news media, whereby it was said that Nigeria has introduced a digital service tax of 6%. Right. Um, so although Nigeria did not introduce a digital service tax of 6%, what we had in our local laws, what we had in the past was that in a situation whereby the tax authorities um, believe that a company is probably not paying the right tax, what the tax authorities can do is that they typically, what they typically do practically is that they would deem your 20% of your revenue will be deemed as profits. Now, if 20% of your revenue is deemed as profit, our tax rate, our company income tax rate in Nigeria for large companies is 30%. So 30% of the 20% gives you the 6%, right? Mm -hmm. So invariably, that's why um, people were coming up with the suggestion that just apply 6% of the revenue, right? But in actual sense, that's not what the law says. Um, the tax authorities can simply tax these entities on a fair and reasonable basis. So if any of these entities discover that um, that 6% that is being given by the tax authorities is not fair, they can simply just um, go on and show how they arrived at their own actual profit and reject the, mm. deemed, um, the deemed assessment given by the tax authorities. Now to um, that question regarding those entities that were mentioned by Kingsley. Um, I'm sure you would have seen um, in the news that most of these companies that he made mention of, they've actually said that they are actually going to begin to introduce VAT on their, um, their on, their services, on, the, on their transactions. Exactly. They're going to introduce that VAT of 7.5%. So these companies are actually complying and these companies have actually um, informed their customers that they are actually going to raise their taxes by, by introducing that VAT portion, which is something that is now required by um, the tax laws. So basically, I would say, yes, Nigeria is actually taking advantage of these things. And um, the FRS is learning every day, from what I understand and from what I've seen. We've seen situations whereby they've moved from one platform to another platform for more efficiency. So over time, it's expected that a lot more will be generated from some of these companies. But one thing I also believe is that these companies themselves, they are ready to comply because Nigeria is a large market. They've seen advantages, they've seen opportunities, and they themselves, considering they are compliant, they are they are happy to comply. That, that's what I would say about that. Very, very wonderful. They are happy to comply because Nigeria has the very big market that they are actually tapping into. Uh, to our viewers this evening, I've actually been guesting Mr. Abiodukai Ode Ali, uh, who has been discussing taxation of digital economy and the two pillar solution, the implications for Nigeria. Uh, but uh, let me quickly go on a very short break. And then uh, when I come back, we'll be rounding up our thoughts for today on the topic. Please stay tuned. I will be right back. While we are waiting for the technique. As a finance professional in a disrupted business landscape, what does it take to be in demand? What does it take to attract great paying international roles? If you're an ICANN member, it'll just take one exam. That's all it takes to complete the globally recognized SEMA professional qualification and the internationally in respected CGMA designation. As a SEMA member and a CGMA designation holder, employers will look at you as a finance professional, constantly acquiring new skills to add value to the business. That's why they'll be willing to pay premium to hire and retain you. If you have five years of relevant experience and are an ICANN member, you can directly sit for the final exam of the SEMA professional qualification, the strategic case study exam. Start studying the SEMA professional qualification. Prepare to make an impact.
Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. Uh, we have been discussing taxation of the digital economy and the two pillar solution, the implication for uh, Nigeria. And I've been guesting Mr. Abiodun Kayode Ali, who have been doing justice to be topic, enlightening and broadening our knowledge on some of the benefits uh, that uh, we have with this two pillar solution. Welcome back, Mr. Uh, Kayode Ali. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jason. Yeah, before I ask for your final thoughts on this, uh, there's a specific thing you're trying to give about why Nigeria did not sign on to the uh, two-pillar solution. Can you can you run that thought up? Okay, uh, thank you very much once again. Um, so Nigeria didn't sign, um, and the reason why Nigeria didn't sign on to the solution is because based on analysis that the tax authorities did back here, what they simply discovered was that it wasn't going to pay Nigeria from a revenue standpoint. And um, if you look at some of the requirements for that two pillar solution, one of the thing for pillar one, pillar one was actually the one that was an issue. Um, so pillar one had to do with um, taxation of the digital economy, right? And not just the digital economy, it had to do with taxation of multinational corporations but then the pillar one under the pillar one there is an element referred to as amount a okay let me skip that technical term one of the requirements for pillar one was that um before you would scope in a multinational corporation that multinational corporation had to have a global turnover of 20 billion euros 20 billion mm -hmm. euros and a profit margin greater than 10 percent now, if you look at that twin, that condition for scoping in a multinational corporation that will be taxed, it simply meant that only a few, only a few companies would be scoped in. So if it mm. happens that you have a multinational corporation that meets that revenue threshold and also that profitability margin, another thing will then happen. You are going to take the excess of that 10% profit margin so if, for instance, we have um, a, multinational a multinational corporation that has, that has probably 20% profit margin, it simply means excess above the 10%, excess. So that's going to be 20 minus 10. 10%, 10 of, that, of that revenue is what is going to be available. A quarter of 10% of that revenue is what is going to be available. So by the time you look at the final mm. outcome that is going to come to the countries that this particular um, revenue will be shared, this particular profit will be shared, the amount that will be coming to Nigeria was going to be very small compared to what Nigeria has in place. If you look at the significant economic presence, the significant economic presence you are simply referring to 25 million as a threshold for digital economies. Whereas when you are looking at, um, when you are looking at, the basis for which Nigeria can generate very, more from the other small. It, 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 exactly. So, so what Nigeria simply decided was that, see, if you consider the threshold under our significant economic presence, we'll be able to scope in a lot more multinational very, entities very small. compared to what um, the pillar one is actually giving us. So these are the, these are the issues that Nigeria and some other countries had, revenue challenges, then also there were other challenges that had to do with administrative challenges, um, arbitration, things like that. So these are some of the reasons why Nigeria decided to take a, seat, a back seat and probably do further work in conjunction with other regional bodies, such as the Africa Tax Administration Forum, before we, um, we look back and go back into that particular agreement. So these are some of the reasons why Nigeria didn't sign on to that two-pillar solution. Okay, okay. Very wonderful. There seems to be a little 
uh, break uh, uh, while you are giving that up. But we can have it as we are coasting up, uh, Mr. Kayode uh, Lee. Uh, on this program, we had uh, about VUCA, and I know that we have VUCA accountant and professional accountant uh, wishing to specialize in digital uh, taxation. And uh, one of the refresher thing the presenter gave to Ross while we're talking about VUCA is Tori Tool. Tori Tool. Uh, we are asking, are there certification required for this digital taxation expert? If yes, can you educate our member in just a minute? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, to be, uh, I, I actually, to be honest, in a, in a, in a single sentence, I, I don't think you need any um, such certification. You actually don't. So okay. one thing I need to clearly state is as long as you are, you are a practicing, um, you are a practicing tax consultant in Nigeria, as long as you are certified or you are a chartered accountant, I think you are good enough to, um, to study on your own, right? You can study on your own and you can analyze most of these issues that are going on globally. One thing I would like to say is that when it comes to taxation of the digital economy, if you look at the two pillar solution, the two pillar solution is actually a complex framework, very complex. And it's something that a lot of countries are still studying, right? Because of its complexity, that's on one hand. When it now comes to um, here in Nigeria, what you simply have to do is you need to be a chartered accountant definitely for you to be able to um, help companies or help yourself in um, computing your taxes, right? So th that's what I can say. I don't think you need any form of technicality and you can you can read up materials. We have lots of bodies that are actually coming up with um, materials on the taxation of the digital economy. PwC, Very for instance, good. we have articles that we, we write and um, there are also articles that are being released by the OECD the Organization for Economic mm. Cooperation and Development. So you can get materials online and you can watch some very, of the videos that are available. Yeah. Very, very brilliant. But the problem is time is not always our friend uh, because I'm just feeling the vibrancy of this topic that we are discussing today. And the last one is just to say before you can even, there's no extra time. To practice this digital economy transition, all you need to do is to be a chartered accountant and you are closed enough. In 30 seconds, as you're closing and patting short, uh, what should professional accountant do or watch out for in order to be more productive and be relevant in the transition of both the traditional and the digital economy? 30 seconds. Okay, so one thing I'll say is knowledge is power. Right, knowledge is key for everything. Information is king, right here. So, what I would simply say is first of all, join a professional body such as ICANN and any other professional body that we have and try and develop yourself, try and read up. You can also go online and get materials that are very useful in the current times. And as long as you continue to do this, the sky is the starting point, not the limit. So, what I'll just simply say is always educate yourself and never stop learning. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. And that was a very good way to add our episode for today. Get more information on daily basis, research more. Join professional body like us, the Institute of Chartered Accountant of Nigeria, and do online research. Educate yourself so that you can equip yourself with the latest thing. Uh, sincerely speaking, I need to appreciate our guest for today, Mr. Abiodun Kayode Ali. Sincerely speaking, you did justice to this. And I want to believe when next we call, you will definitely yield the floor to be part of this program. Thank you very much for spending your time, your evening with us on ICANN on air. Thank you. And on Thank this note, we have come to the end of it. But before I go, I quickly want to bring some few announcements uh, to us. Like you can see, uh, while we are having the program, we have the announcement of uh, the annual accountant conference, the 52nd annual accountant conference holding at the International Conference Center and Sheraton Hotel from October 10 to 14. And the theme is Nigeria, 
adopting sustainability for economic prosperity. Uh, sincerely speaking, we've had seasoned uh, professionals that are out there to come and talk to you and I on this topic. For those of us that will be there, registration is on. Just log on to our website, uh, ICANN website, and get more details of uh, this uh, registration. Registration is strictly online. And also, the World Accountant uh, Conference is holding in India. And there are arrangements that have been put in place to make sure that the institute is well represented. So you can always contact uh, the the. the Secretariat is being digitalized as we speak. Everything is digitalized, and you just need to get in tune with the current trend of things. I will always do that. On this note, I will be bringing the program to a close. And uh, to see you again on Thursday as we come with another topic. I remain your host, Olusheson Okwade, FCA. See you again on Thursday. Bye for now.